By now, you've probably heard about the Titan submersible and the terrible fate of its five passengers. Many have speculated about what happened to the victims, and it seems that there is plenty of confusion surrounding the incident. If the title of this video has crossed your mind, then I invite you to join me as we cross-check what we know about Titan and its passengers with what we know about human anatomy in an attempt to deepen our understanding. And before we proceed any further, I extend my sincere condolences to the families of the victims who were involved in this incident. A remote operated vehicle discovered the tail cone of the Titan submersible approximately 1,600 feet from the bow of the Titanic. A couple weeks ago, after debris was found on the ocean floor, authorities concluded that the submersible, which was designed to take high paying passengers on a tour of the Titanic wreckage, was lost. The debris is consistent with the catastrophic loss of the pressure chamber. OceanGate CEO Stockton Rush was forthcoming about the experimental nature of this vessel. I've broken some rules to make this. I think I've broken them with, with logic and good engineering behind me, the carbon fiber and titanium. There's a rule you don't do that. Well, I did. Obviously, once tickets are sold and the public becomes involved, the experimental design becomes a glaring liability and questionable, at best, approach to safety. James Cameron, whose achievements as a movie director often overshadow his contributions to the deep submergence community, said about his own experimental vessel. That sub was a single seater. I assessed the risk and those were risks I was willing to take. I would never ask someone else to take that type of risk. Thousands of meters below the surface of the ocean, even the smallest systems failure or mechanical oversight can result in what is termed catastrophic implosion incredibly unforgiving uh, environment down there. The debris is consistent with a catastrophic implosion of uh, the vessel. In today's video, we'll examine this catastrophic implosion from a detailed medical perspective, as well as quirks of human anatomy that A, leave us susceptible to high pressure in the first place, and B, dictate the fate of the passengers. In an interview with Global News, Charles Beaker, a professor of Indiana University's Center for Underwater Science, explained that at the Titanic Titanic's depth, 3,800 meters, the pressure on the submersible would have been 400 times the pressure at the surface. He goes on to say, they weren't to the depth of the Titanic, they were maybe two thirds of the way down, which is estimated. That amount of pressure, 250 to 280 times the surface pressure, an implosion would have been very quick. Almost like turning on a light switch. It just happens. So I've received an unbelievable amount of requests to make a video about how to turn on the light. Although this clip from the Hydraulic Press channel features a 3D printed titanium submarine and happens on a much smaller, less complicated scale, it can give us a sense of the immediacy of collapse under pressure. Come on! Yes! First, we'll need a basic understanding of underwater pressure, technically known as hydrostatic pressure. On the surface of the earth, or at sea level, we experience some pressure from the weight of the air in the atmosphere above us. This is why pressure is measured in atmospheres, a unit equivalent to around 15 pounds per square inch. An article from Scientific American can help us out as we start descending into the ocean and the air's weight is joined by that of the water. For every 33 feet or 10 meters of salt water depth, pressure increases by another atmosphere. So let's say the Titan implosion happened at 3,048 meter depth or approximately 10,000 feet depth. The hydrostatic pressure would be approximately 4,500 PSI, which for the record is greater than the force of the bite of a saltwater crocodile. Metaphorically speaking, the fragmenting submarine becomes the crocodile's jaws, crushing the people inside. But we'll get to that. If, alternatively, a human body were transported slowly down to 3,000 meters without the protection of a submarine, they wouldn't implode under the pressure of the water. Hydrostatic pressure deep in the ocean is not applied to the body in the same manner as a crocodile bite. It is not an acute or pinpoint application of a high energy force. Under the weight of the water alone, pressure is exerted equally from all sides of the object or tissue that is exposed to the water. This is complicated by the fact that the water is not compressible and our bodies are made largely out of water. 
A historical study conducted in 1945 by Mitchell et al. set the foundation for our understanding of the chemical composition of the human body, explaining that the brain and heart are composed of 73% water, the lungs approximately 83%, while the skin contains 64% water, muscles and kidneys are 79%, and even the bones are watery themselves at 31%. I must also add that our bones are filled with bone marrow, which is a soft tissue that comes in two varieties. Number one, red bone marrow, which is filled with blood plasma, 90% water, and produces blood cells, and two, yellow bone marrow, which is mainly fat cells, chemically closer to oil, but also widely considered non-compressible in most applications. Therefore, most of our body tissues, including our bones, are resistant to the crushing effect of hydrostatic pressure, even at depths similar to that of the Titan implosion. The air contained inside various tissues in our bodies, on the other hand, is compressible, and this is where our trouble begins. In most healthy circumstances, there is air in the lungs, respiratory tract, sinuses, and possibly even the digestive tract. Otherwise, the internal organs are held closely together with only fluid between them. Pockets of air might occur in serious conditions such as pneumothorax or gastrointestinal perforation, but that is a discussion for another time. If a diver descended beyond the safe depth, the tissue surrounding these air pockets will collapse and your anatomy may be rearranged slightly in the process. Ribs broken, lung tissue ruptured or torn, as though the Hulk is squeezing your chest between his hands. But the concept of a person being crushed like a tube of toothpaste due to hydrostatic pressure alone isn't totally accurate. In fact, without air pockets to contend with, there is no actual crush depth for the human anatomy. This is why some whales, yes, mammals who breathe air, are able to travel to the depths of the ocean by collapsing their lungs and rib cages voluntarily. This is part of the reason why we have experimented with breathing oxygen-rich liquid for diving. A mouse can survive unharmed for hours. Completely submerged, the mouse is breathing a special highly oxygenated liquid chemical compound. Breathing oxygenated perfluorocarbon, a man-made liquid compound containing fluorine, carbon, and oxygen, was first demonstrated successfully on mice by researchers Clark and Golan in 1966. Since then, humans have assumed the role of test subject in various studies. Fluid breathing system, we just got them. You use it when you go really deep. How deep? Deep. A man named Francis J. Falacek was the first man to breathe oxygenated fluid through his lungs during trials conducted by Kleistra in the early 1970s. Describing the experience as not overly uncomfortable, Second, it's perfectly normal. It's <laughs> perfectly normal. We all breathe liquid for nine months, bud. Your body will remember. It was Falachek who gave the lecture that inspired James Cameron to create the abyss, which featured a similar science. Though every scene but the mouse breathing while submerged was movie magic. As of 2023, we have not yet been able to adapt these experimental techniques to real world applications. In the absence of breathable liquid, we must rely on submersible vessels to protect the air pockets inside our bodies. The thing is, these submersible vehicles are also air pockets and collapsible under the ocean's hydrostatic pressure. So their design and the materials used really really matters. If you're building with carbon fiber, you're not really getting the strength to weight ratio and then you have to deal with other things like the fact that carbon fiber degrades over time. Scott Manley, engineer and YouTuber, was one among many to express concerns about the use of carbon fiber in the Titan design. Most sources identify several possible points of failure. Carbon fiber body, connection point between the hull and the body, or the viewport. Any of these possibilities could have precipitated the implosion yielding terrible results for the passengers. First, let's talk about temperature. Shout out to Reddit user Ginger Chris, who seems to have done the math, as well as a Reddit community whose comments help to clarify any misconceptions. The full thread is posted below, but one of Ginger Chris's important takeaways was, my intent was to give an extreme bound, more as a counter to the notion that impressively high temperature equals instant vaporization of everything. I saw a comment which suggested the occupants would have been reduced to a floating cloud of ash, which is just absurd. To which another user named Vivalis responded, gotcha. 
I just thought that basing it completely on heat capacity was overly simplified and heavily misleading. Heat capacity certainly plays into heat transfer, but there is a bunch of other factors at play too. Sure, 1500 Kelvin won't instantly vaporize, but I think there's certainly enough energy in that 1500 Kelvin, heat capacity aside, to scorch the outer layers of anyone, provided they're not being crushed. From what I can tell, their comment exchange ultimately ended in general agreement, which is very hot temperature for a very short time, but not long enough or hot enough to incinerate a body. Now, if Google's free converter is correct, we're talking about a millisecond at 1500 degrees Kelvin, which is equivalent to 1226.85 degrees Celsius or 2240.33 degrees Fahrenheit, which is approximately the heat associated with an open flame. So for practical purposes, we're talking about total immersion in a campfire temperature flame or fire temperature air, if ignition never occurred, for a millisecond inside an undersea pressure cooker. In a kitchen, a pressure cooker works by trapping hot air and moisture with food and speeds the chemical process involved in cooking. If the air ignited, I burned it, all of it. Surely the flesh would be charred, and if not, we'd be looking at the type of severe burns that occur when it comes into contact with hot steam, water, or air. Redness, blistering, etc. If the victims had only the burns to contend with, their bodies would still be intact. U.S. Coast Guard says it has likely recovered human remains from the wreckage of the Titan submersible 10 days after the vessel was first reported missing. The wording issued in the Coast Guard report was slightly less affirmative. Obviously, easily identifiable or full intact human remains are not what the Coast Guard found. At the time of my recording, there is still debate about the point of failure on the vessel. However, we have not seen anything. What we do know is the front and the back are sufficiently far apart that the center collapsed and these things popped out sideways. And as of June 30th, the YouTube channel What Is Going On With Shipping posted a video detailing all of the parts recovered thus far from the wreckage search. This is that area of the porthole window. And this section specifically is the rear equipment bed. And this is some of that outer shell we see coming off. And the list goes on. So most of what you see here is not pressure vessel at all. The only part of the pressure vessel you see is really this porthole window. Thank you for pointing that out, Sal. And if we take a quick look at how carbon fiber, out of which the pressure chamber was fashioned, fails under pressure. This clip from the Crazy Hydraulic Press YouTube channel shows instantaneous violent fragmentation into pieces variable in size, some of which have sharp edges. Once the pressure chamber gives way, the implosion occurs in less than a millisecond with incredible force. On his submarine stream, Scott mentioned, 200 megajoules of energy, which is the kind of energy release we're talking about here. The human body does not handle that well. Later, a participant in the stream comment section pointed out, Yeah, there you go. Somebody is figuring out the fifth, the, the, it's about 47 kilograms of TNT. There you go. And with hard, sharp carbon fiber fragments collapsing inward with the force of a whole heap of TNT. The blast we're seeing here is only 20 kilograms. Scott's next comment really hits home. You go from being biology to being physics, right? It doesn't really matter at that point. You're just, the cells are just smashed and destroyed. Other examples have been proposed all over the internet and media, including this one by David Corley, a retired Navy captain and engineer. When a submarine hull collapses, it moves inward at about 1500 miles per hour. That's 2,200 feet per second. After gathering information from many sources, I can imagine a mixture of carbon fiber fragments of various sizes crushing inward at unimaginable speed as water collapses into space. Sadly, the Titan sub disintegrates in a fraction of a second, turning into scrap metal, just as the signal to the mothership is lost. Any body part contained within rigid portions of the submarine chamber would be pulverized instantaneously into a fine goo or paste. Human anatomy be damned. To put it bluntly, the crew became kinda like a human sauce in the blink of an eye. 
If somehow a body part were not trapped between larger surfaces, say for example the arm or leg of a passenger near to the front or back of the carbon fiber, it would be bludgeoned by rushing water laced with fragments of carbon fiber and essentially shredded to tiny pieces. Also, as the air in the submarine is compressed under immense hydrostatic pressure, it rushes out between any cracks or spaces in the more rigid materials, fragmented carbon fiber, possibly even through the hull and rear portion. Human body parts will be forced through these same spaces. This phenomenon is very much like human toothpaste. As the jumble of carbon fiber and human body parts collapses inwards and compressed air attempts to escape outwards, the weakest material will suffer the greatest amount of damage. Technically, carbon fiber composites are much stronger than bone and also, of course, all other human tissue. I've seen the Biford Dolphin incident brought up several times in relation to what happened on Titan. This is an oil rig that suffered an explosive decompression, air sucked out of a space under high pressure in 1983 that killed four divers and one dive tender, as well as badly injuring another dive tender. One of the victims, Trulis Helovic, was located beside a partially open door and exposed to extreme pressure under the force of air trying to escape the vessel. His body sucked through an opening only 24 inches in diameter. The tissue simply gave way to accommodate the size of the hole in the stronger material. Total failure, not unlike a crude meat grinder. In Helvig's case, some body parts remained intact because there are many body parts and organs that are smaller than 24 inches. In the Titan incident, we're dealing with greater pressure, a heavily fragmented pressure vessel, and the distinct possibility of body parts forced through very small spaces. Under sufficient pressure, seemingly rigid materials behave, well, like less rigid materials. Ever heard of Delta P? Physics Footnotes explains. Commercial divers use the phrase Delta P, or sometimes just DP, as shorthand for differential pressure, to describe a potential diving hazard in which there is water movement from an area of high pressure to an area of lower pressure. The term is somewhat an ominous one, being a culprit in two out of three commercial diving fatalities. A Delta P situation as you dive near it. It grabs you suddenly, and it doesn't let go until the pressure is equalized. Here we see a crab pulled through a slit in a dredge pipeline not even one centimeter wide. This shark suffers a similar fate through a comparably small opening, only this time at the active end of a dredge pump. Again, I'm struck by the immediacy of the interaction. One moment they're there and the next, gone. Whatever remains come out of the drainage end of the pipeline must be small enough to fit through the hole through whence their journey suddenly began, toothpaste. Again, depending on the actual orientation of the pieces of the submarine and the victims within it at the moment of implosion, I can envision a very small identifiable piece of a victim's body surviving the chaos. Say, a finger, a tooth, a small fragment of bone, but that's probably about it. Truly horrifying. Circling back to the Coast Guard's press release. Their word presumed really packs a punch. The one saving grace, as many people have accurately mentioned, is that the near instantaneous speed at which this catastrophe occurred foregoes the victim's consciousness of it. That your brain doesn't even receive the message in time. You're you're already biologically dead. So you're really not aware of it. While the exact timing can vary depending on individual factors and the specific circumstances, there is a general process involved with feeling pain. First, nerve endings called nociceptors detect pain, usually within 0.1 to 1 millisecond. Signals then travel to the spinal cord through nerve fibers, taking approximately 5 to 50 milliseconds. Initial neural processing occurs in the spinal cord, taking around 5 to 10 milliseconds. And finally, the brain process the signals and pain is perceived within tens to hundreds of milliseconds. Of course, the Titan implosion occurred in a single millisecond. Even the process of eyesight is too slow. The victims wouldn't even have been aware of the collapse. The first step in the process of sight alone, that is when the light enters the eye and reaches the retina, 
takes around one to 10 milliseconds. Not to mention the remainder of the process as photoreceptor cells in the retina convert light into electrical signals within milliseconds. And those signals travel through the optic nerve to the brain, one to 10 milliseconds, arriving in the brain for neural processing while the brain interprets the signals, which can take hundreds of milliseconds. The brain does a great job making us feel as though our participation in the world around us is instantaneous. But that in turn is completely an illusion. And in the case of the victims of the Titan catastrophe, a very forgiving one. Again, my heart goes out to the victims and their families. I hope today's video was informative. Please do not hesitate to share your thoughts in the comment section down below. If you liked the video, be sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe. If you didn't, be sure to let me know why in the comment section down below. And as always, that's been a word from Dr. Chris, not your everyday ortho, where we see one, do one, 